Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the lecture number two, Offer and Acceptance of Elements of the Law of Contract. I hope everybody is ready. Um, I hope, Caroline, you have your coffee with you. In two lectures, I've come to know that Caroline loves her coffee. So let's begin. <clears throat> In the previous uh, lecture, you might have remembered that we discussed categories of English law, uh, which are private law and public law, and then we looked at the categories of private law um, and so forth. Um, and then we all agreed that contract law comes under private law and contract law creates personal obligations. We also talked a little bit about subjective approach and objective approach. Um, of the courts when they find the intentions of the parties. Um, so I would like to start this lecture by asking you um, a question, uh, actually three questions, uh, which are what is meant by a subjective approach? The uh, second question is what is meant by an objective approach? And which approach is preferred by the courts, uh, English courts? So. Let's look at the subjective approach first. So what is meant by a subjective approach? Can I have a volunteer? Good. All right. So Jennifer is saying subjective approaches as the actual intentions of the party. Excellent, Jennifer. Very good. So what is? Um, I see some people you're having trouble uh, hearing me. Can you try to log in again, please? And when you join the meeting, click on the little headphone sign uh, that says "Call from Computer," and you should be able to hear me then. All right. So let's talk about objective approach. So what is an objective approach? Anyone? Yasha said that it's from a non-biased person's point of view. Very good. So in um, what a reasonable person in the position of the party's intentions would have been. Excellent. Very good. So uh, Yasha and Jennifer, you both are right. Um, so of what a reasonable person would have thought in the, who was in uh, the position of the parties. So that is the objective approach. Um, all right, and which approach is preferred by English courts? What is the approach? Objective, yes. Yes, excellent. Yes, Sandeep, you're right. Uh, Yasha, Jennifer, Caroline. Andrea, absolutely. So everybody knows that the English courts prefer objective approach when they try to find the intentions of the of the party. So the, basically, the idea of just to reiterate what we learned, the idea of agreement um, was the vehicle uh, which the courts used to invoke the idea of individualistic consenting. It was said that there should be a meeting of minds in order to establish a contract. Um, and we should not imagine that the courts would concern themselves with what the parties actually thought at that time, at, at, the making, at the time they made the contract. In most circumstances, the court, through the use of reasonable person test, would decide what it would have been reasonable for the parties to have thought. So it makes more sense. <clears throat> All right. So, um, uh, as we know that contract law is about enforcement of promises, and those promises are voluntarily entered into, not the one that were imposed by law. Um, and you should keep in mind that not all agreements are contracts. 
So um, when is a contract taken to the court of law? When does it come uh, to to the court and when, when is it questioned? Um, it is taken to the court of law when there is a dispute about one or more elements of the contract. So in a case of dispute between the parties, uh, courts need to find out if the agreement was indeed a contract. So they need to look at all the elements that are required for, for it to be a contract and they need to know whether all of the elements were present. <clears throat> And um, so uh, this brings us to two main elements of the contract, which are offer and acceptance, absolutely crucial elements. Uh, so in this, uh, uh, in this lecture, we are going to look at how to identify an offer and how to distinguish an offer from an invitation to treat. And we'll also look at um, how to identify an acceptance. And how to distinguish acceptance from counter offer or other responses to offer. So it is absolutely essential for us to learn how to identify offer and acceptance because this is what the courts uh, question when a dispute arises in order to find out whether all the elements of the contract are uh, were present in that agreement. Um, we uh, in this lecture we are not going to talk a lot about communication and mode. Uh, a mode of acceptance. Um, we'll talk about that later on uh, next week in our next lecture, but I will mention a little bit about communication of acceptance, but we won't go into depth. And uh, again, uh, in the next lecture next week, we are also going to discuss end of an offer, revocation, lapse, rejection. So all of those kinds of things are going to be discussed in next week. <clears throat> So today, basically, we are just going to learn how to identify offer and how to identify an acceptance. Okay, so um, it is often difficult to decide uh, for a court to whether A uh, actually intended to make an offer or whether he was merely inviting B to make him an offer, which is invitation to treat. Right. So now we are going to learn um, whether uh, we are going to look at different scenarios and see whether those are offers or whether those are invitation to treat. Okay. Um, and why do you think this distinction is crucial? It is very crucial to distinguish between an offer or an invitation to treat because it affects B's ability to create a binding agreement. Okay. So for example, if I say to you um, that, uh, oh, you know, guys, I'm selling my, I'm selling this marker for two dollars or two pounds, let's say. So I'm selling this marker for two pounds. There could be uh, two possible interpretation of the statement that I just said. One interpretation can be that I am offering this marker to one of you whoever is listening to me um, for two pounds. And so one of you just need to accept my offer and create a binding agreement. For example, um, let's say Jennifer said that, okay, I'll buy your marker for two, uh, two pounds. So Jennifer created uh, a legal obligation on me and I am bound to sell this marker to Jennifer. That could be one interpretation. Second interpretation is that I am just inviting you to make an offer. So I'm just saying that I am willing to sell this for two pounds. And basically I'm inviting all of you to make an offer to me. So in that case, if Jennifer makes an offer to me that I will buy your uh, marker for two pounds, I am not bound by that. I have to accept that offer to be bound by it. So that means I'm, I'm under no obligation to sell this to Jennifer. I can sell it to someone else. I can sell this to Caroline, to Andrea, to any, any one of you. Or I might decide that, you know, I really like my marker and I want to keep it with me. So I'm not selling it. So you see the, um, the result of the two scenarios are completely different. So if it was an offer, 
then an acceptance from one of you binds me into a legal obligation. If it was an invitation to treat, then I'm not bound by a response. I can decide whether or not to sell it, sell it to you. So um, here, um, if you look at this example, it's, it's the exactly the same, uh, the example that I gave you. So if A says to B, I'm selling my pen for two pounds. So you know the possible interpretations, right? So can you tell me two possible interpretations? Just to reinforce what I uh, what we just discussed. Offer or invitation. Either it's an offer or an invitation. Okay, let's suppose it is let's suppose it is an invitation to treat. So mm -hmm. Then not binding, yes, Sandeep, excellent. Then it is not, it is not binding. Uh, A is not bound by B's response. Excellent. All right. So for an agreement, there are two scenarios like we just discussed. So scenario number one is offer plus acceptance makes an agreement. Scenario number two is invitation, offer, and then acceptance. And then it amounts to an agreement, right? So in the example that we just discussed, I made an invitation. I'm, I'm looking at scenario number two right now. So I made an invitation to treat. Uh, one of you said, I will buy your, okay, I will buy your marker for two pounds. Now that is an offer, right? And then I. I need to accept that offer and I need to say, okay, I accept your offer and I will sell my pen to you for two pounds. That is an acceptance. So now we have a legally binding agreement. Um, okay, so if I were to create a formula for no agreement, what would it be? Simply replace uh, acceptance by rejection. So offer plus rejection is no agreement, right? Invitation plus offer plus rejection is no agreement. Right? So in the previous example, um, if the facts were changed so that A said, um, or if I had said that I am offering you this particular pen for two pounds, you have half an hour to decide. This pen is yours for two pounds if you want it. Then it would have been easier to analyze this scenario and say that it was an offer rather than an invitation to treat, right? Because my intentions seem very clear that I am making an offer and I'm giving you a set time limit to accept my offer. I'm being very particular with my words. So it would have been easier to say that it is an offer. But unfortunately, people often do not express themselves very clearly in real life, right? And that is why we see these kinds of questions arising in the courts. So that's why we are, we are learning this uh, about this, and that's why we are you know, studying elements of the law of contract, because people do not express themselves very clearly in, in real life. So let's look at the leading case, okay? Um, Gibson versus Manchester. So let's look at the facts of the case. I'm sure you might have read it um, before, but we're going to discuss it. Um, so defendant, the counsel, right, sent the claimant, uh, Gibson, a letter stating that the counsel may be prepared to sell the house to you at the purchase price of 2,725 pounds. If you would like to make a formal application to buy your council house, please complete the form and return it to me as soon as possible. So pay attention to the wording. If you would like to make a formal application to buy your council house, please complete the form and return it to me as soon as possible. So Mr. Gibson completed and returned the form. 
council then changed its policy on the sale of council houses. And Gibson was advised by the council um, that the council was unable to proceed with his application because the council changed its requirement and the Labour Party had won the elections. So the whole, the whole policy changed. So Gibson brought the action claiming that the council letter was an offer, right, and which he accepted by returning the application form. So that was Gibson's argument. Okay, so can anyone tell me, please, uh, what what do you think the courts would have, uh, you know, would have said to Gibson in response to Gibson's claim? So Gibson is saying that counsel's letter, where the counsel stated that um, if you would like to make a formal application to buy your uh, council house, please complete the form and return it. So Gibson is saying that that letter was an offer, which he accepted when he returned the application form. Wording is, Okay, so the phrase may be prepared to sell means that it is not an offer. It could be, yeah, which means that it is not binding. No binding offer. Council said may be prepared to sell. Okay, no offer. Very vague. Yes, Anu is saying that may is the, the term may is very vague. Huh, so the Court of Appeal said something else. Um, Lord Denning, especially, he said that um, he thought that there was an agreement and there is no need to look for a strict offer and acceptance. That's what the Court of Appeal held. However, it was appealed, and House of Lords agree with all of you. So, Lord Diplock criticized Lord Denning's approach um, and he said that we are unable to find any matching offer and acceptance. Right, and then the term uh, again. The emphasis was uh, emphasis was put on the term may be prepared, like all of you suggested. So House of Lords agreed with all of you. Okay, <clears throat> right, and the another thing that they stated that. Council never intended the letter to allow Gibson to create a binding agreement between them, right? And simply meant, that letter simply meant uh, to inform him that they are prepared, they, they may be prepared, so he needs to make an offer, right? <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to discuss a presumption. Um, A presumption, uh, let's look at a scenario and then I'll come to the presumption. So you advertise your bike in a newspaper, right? And often your uh, you put an ad in a newspaper, right? So what is it? Is it an uh, offer or is it an invitation to treat? What do you need to keep in mind is that do you want to be bound to sell your bike to every reader who replies to you? Most probably not. Most probably not, right? It would be it would be unreasonable. It would be absurd if you are bound by every reader uh, who read your ad and replied to you. Then would then you would be in a in a legal complication, right? You will be bound by you will be bound to sell your bike to all of the people who replied to you. So for the sake of certainty, courts sometimes fall back onto a presumption. And that presumption is that it is uh, it is commonly presumed that vendor only intended to make an invitation to treat. So when it comes to an ad or advertisement, courts think um, it is it, it is common um, it is reasonable to fall back on the presumption that that ad was just an invitation to treat. <clears throat> now. 
uh, one thing you need to uh, remember about the presumption is that presumption comes into play only when the intention of the vendor is unclear. Right? So if you have clear evidence of vendor's intention, then you do not need to fall back on presumption. You should therefore look for evidence first and see if the intention is clear. If the intention is not clear, then you may fall back onto a presumption. So if in your ad where you are uh, offering, um, uh, you are putting an ad to sell uh, your bike, if, you, if the wording of the ad is very clear that you are making an offer, then the courts do not need to fall back on the presumption that the ad was an invitation to print. So as we discussed, generally advertisements are invitation to treat, right? Because the seller does not want to be bound by all the readers of the ad who replied. Let's look at the leading case of this, which is Partridge versus Crittenden. You know, I, I, I found it funny that uh, Partridge involves, this case involves uh, birds. And partridge, the word partridge itself means a, a, a bird, this particular bird that you're looking at. So this is the partridge. So the reason I put this picture here is that for those who are very strong visual learners should associate this picture with the word advertisement. So whenever in an exam you see the word advertisement, this word should come into your mind and you should think that partridge versus pretending is the leading case on that. So um, let's look at the facts of the case. Partridge placed an advertisement offering to sell a live bird, right? And that act, selling of a live bird, was contrary to the Protection of Birds Act. Okay. So <clears throat> it was held that the advertisement was merely an invitation to treat, which means if it was invitation to treat, Partridge uh, had done nothing wrong, right? He had not violated protection of the Birds Act. So let's look at the wording of the ad. You can see the wording of the ad. It is simply quality British ABCR Bramble Pitch Fox Bramble Pitch Hems, 25 shillings each. So those were the facts of the, of the case. Let's look at the decision. The so magistrate's court um, thought that it was an offer and it contravened Section 6 of the Protection of the Birds Act. The case was appealed, of course, and High Court decided that the advertisement was an invitation to treat, so it did not constitute an offer or an offense under the statute. Now, we looked at the words of the ad. So because, of, because the form of the words used were ambiguous, we can say that the court presumed that ad was an invitation to treat. They presumed that ad was an invitation to treat because it made practical sense. Like we just discussed, that, an, that a seller does not, does not want to be bound by all those who reply to him or her. And Mr. Partridge had not said anything in the ad that was contrary, right? So we did not see any clear intention in the wording of the ad that Partridge was trying to make an offer. Okay, so let's suppose if this ad counted as an offer, then Mr. Partridge would have been in a very difficult position, right? Uh, presumably, he had a limited stock of birds, limited stock of wild, specific wild birds that he was selling. Then he would have been bound to provide that specific type of bird mentioned in the ad for the said price to everyone who accepted it. So it would have been very absurd. So it is, it is also common sense to, to presume that you know, these kinds of ads are only invitations to treat. Now, uh, in the US, we have a contrasting case. Um, although US cases are not binding in England and Wales, but it is often used as an example, right? It is used as an example of how a case might be decided in England and Wales. So it is important for you to know this case as well, as it is a very contrasting case. And by all means, uh, refer to it in your exams as well when 
when it comes to distinguishing an offer from an invitation to treat. So um, an ad for three per course for one dollar each, right? First come, first served. That that was the the ad that was placed, and it was held to be an offer, not an invitation to treat. The reason, uh, the reason it was reasonable to reject the usual presumption of an invitation to treat. Uh, and to conclude that shopkeeper intended to make an offer to the first three customers. So the ad clearly indicated that there are three per course. First come, first serve, right? So the seller is uh, made it very clear in the wording of the ad that, they, that he is just um, offering it to the first three customers. Okay. So had it not been limited to the first three customers, then the courts would have fallen back onto the presumption, right? As it is commercially unreasonable to provide per courts for $1 to the whole state of Minnesota. Right? We can also argue that unless Lefkowitz had enough per courts for everyone in Minnesota, right? If, if he had enough courts for everyone in Minnesota, then then it would have, wouldn't have been a problem. And what if everyone in Minnesota wanted 10 quotes? Then it would have become very absurd. So you see how unreasonable it becomes if a general ad is considered an offer. So by general ad, I mean the one that does not limit itself to serve uh, maybe first three customers, first five, or to a limited number of customers. So we can conclude that many ads the general ad that does not that do not limit itself, like the one in Partridge versus Cretendon, are merely invitations to treat. Right? However, if the advertiser makes his intentions to offer very clear by adding elements to it, right, like the one in Lefkowitz, then the ad will be an offer. Okay, so it becomes more confusing when it comes to uh, displays, this particular type of advertisement. So the displays that you see in the market, like if you're walking on the street and you see something uh, displayed in the, in the window of the shop. So it is uh, almost always ambiguous, right? And the presumption is that displays are invitation to treat. So that is the general presumption of the courts, unless special circumstances are present. So what are some special circumstances? Those are such as clear intentions or maybe a clear wording, maybe a tag uh, right beside the, the display saying that uh, this, this offer is limited to first three customers, like the one in that case. Right. So, um, or, or any other evidence that there would be no problem supplying all those entitled to accept the offer. So if those circum, uh, uh, special circumstances are present, then the displays can be offered. But generally, they are invitation to treat. We have two leading cases uh, with regard to displays. Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain versus Boots. Okay, Boots Cash Chemist. Um, so, it was illegal to sell some certain kind of poisons. But Boots had, had those poisons displayed in their shop, right? So, it was basically illegal to sell those poisons without uh, proper supervision. Right? But Boots did not have any proper supervision at the, at the displays. So people could easily go and pick up, the, pick up those, that drug and put it in their basket, go to the cashier or the teller. Right? And when, but at the teller or at the cashier, Boots had proper supervision. Okay? So the claimant, right, pharmaceutical society, said that sale took place when the customer put the drug in their shopping basket. But Boots claimed that sale takes place at the till or at the cash register, 
and there is a proper supervision there. So Booth said that we are not doing anything illegal. We have proper supervision at the cashier or at the cash register and sale takes place at the cash register. So the courts sided with Booth and uh, it was held that um, displays are only an invitation to treat and when the customer goes to the cash register, that is where the sale takes place. That is where the offer and acceptance takes place. And over there, booths had proper supervision. Okay. Another important case is Fisher versus Bell. <clears throat> in this case, um, a display of a flick knife in the shop window uh, when it was criminal offense to offer flick knife for sale. It involves a display of a flick knife on the shop window and it was illegal at that time. It was a criminal offense to offer flick knife for sale. So a constable, a police constable passing by thought that display of a flick knife is an offer for sale. And he thought that uh, the, the defendant is doing something illegal. But the court sided with the defendant and said that display is an invitation to treat, it is not an offer, therefore there, no offense was taking place. So these are our two main cases for displays. <clears throat> okay. So the problem that now we're going to look at options, right? Here also a display is involved, but the display is made in the auction room, okay? Uh, also, it is important to distinguish between two types of auctions, auction with reserve and auction without reserve, okay? Auction with reserve is where a minimum bid is set. For example, if I'm selling a, a very, um, an antique, nice piece of art uh, in an auction, I don't want it to be sold for just maybe one one pound, okay? So in that case, I would do an option with reserve and I would set a bid, I'll say, okay, the lowest, the minimum bid should be 250 pounds and, and then the bidders will um, start bidding and the picture will be sold to the highest bidder. Option without reserve is where there is no bid, bid is not set, right? So people start bidding and, and it is, uh, the object is sold to the highest bidder. So this is the difference between auction with reserve and auction without reserve. Auction with reserve has a set bid, minimum bid. Auction without reserve does not have a set minimum bid, okay? So as I said, the problem in the auction is that the display is made in the auction room and it becomes more uh, difficult when it is displayed on the, or is, is auctioned at an internet site. For example, eBay. Uh, I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with eBay. Now there is a controversy and there is a lot of argument that whether or not eBay is an auctioneer, but for the purposes of this lecture, let's assume that eBay is the auctioneer, okay? So if you uh, want to sell something on eBay, for example. So eBay is the auctioneer and eBay acts as your agent, right? And so eBay on your behalf makes an invitation to treat. So this is the uh, object and we are accepting bids. Bidders make the offer, okay? And highest offer is usually accepted in the case of auction without reserve. So auctioneer, uh, in this case eBay, can withdraw the goods at any time before a bid is accepted. Again, to reiterate, the auctioneer on your behalf makes an invitation to treat. The bidder makes an offer. The auctioneer on your behalf accepts the offer. And when the auctioneer accepts your offer, they are legally bound to sell the, uh, and you also become legally bound to sell your object to the highest bidder, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So um, in this case, British car options versus ride. Very briefly, I'll tell you about this case. Uh, the auctioneer was convicted of making an offer to sell. Okay, so the auctioneer was convicted of making an offer to sell an unroadworthy car contrary to the Road Traffic Act of 1960. His appeal was allowed on the same ground as Partridge versus Crittenden and Fisher versus Bell. And what was that? What was that ground? Okay. Invitation to read, yes. Absolutely. So uh, his appeal was um, allowed on the ground that auctions are invitation to treat. All right, but it gets a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> Another thing we need to understand with regard to auctions is that auctioneer um, acts on uh, in two capacities, okay? So auctioneer is working as an agent of the seller, so your auctioneer is your agent, right? And makes an invitation to treat, like we just discussed. But auctioneer also works in personal capacity and makes an offer. So the same same offer, for example, we go back to the example that uh, your auctioneer is selling something for you. So when uh, when the auctioneer display your object, right? And they said that we are uh, accepting bids then your auctioneer is your agent and is making an invitation to the tree, but the auctioneer in, in its personal capacity is making an offer. Now that creates a problem, right? What if the seller, what if you remove the item after the highest bid, but before the auctioneer accepts it? The interesting thing is that you are under no obligation because you had made an invitation to the the auctioneer on your behalf had made an invitation to you. But the auctioneer is in problem because auctioneer in his personal capacity had made an offer to sell to the highest bidder, right? So the, uh, the buyer cannot, uh, cannot sue you, but buyer can sue the auctioneer. <clears throat> so this kind of contract that exists between the auctioneer and the buyer is called a collateral or on the side contract. Okay. So collateral contract, which means there is another contract on the side. And the case for this is Warlaw versus Harrison. Okay. Okay. So I, I advise you to look at the obiter dicta of this case, Warlaw versus Harrison. Uh, actually, the arbitrary dicta of this case was the court said that uh, the, claim, uh, the claimant had sued uh, the seller, right? So the court decided that no seller may, had made an invitation to treat. But the court in its arbitrary dicta stated that if the claimant had sued the auctioneer, he would have been successful, okay? All right, so that brings us to uh, tenders. So you just need to remember for tenders that <clears throat> request for a tender, like a tender notice that you see in the newspaper is an invitation to treat. And the tender itself is an offer to buy the goods at a tender price. We'll look at one of the cases here. So there are two leading cases, but we're going to look at Blackpool Aero Club, okay? So Blackpool <clears throat> Aero Club, in Blackpool Aero Club, defendant had invited seven parties to tender for a concession to operate pleasure flights from the airport. Okay. So defendant's invitation prescribed a clear, orderly, and familiar procedure for tender. And also indicated that, this is very important, they indicated that we will consider all offer made before specified date and, uh, and time and late tenders will not be considered. So claimants submitted their tender in accordance with these regulations. However, uh, defendant's designated box into which claimant tender was placed within the deadline was not emptied until after the deadline. Therefore, 
claimant's tender was not considered. Okay. So general presumption here applies that the council just made an invitation to the and the flight club made an offer which was never accepted. However, uh, the council was held to have made a separate offer to consider all tenders which were posted before the dead map. The claimants accepted this offer by posting their tender before the deadline, and the council breached this collateral agreement because it did not even consider the club's tender. Okay. So the general presumption did apply that a tender is an invitation to free, but the court said that they were under another kind of collateral contract right? because they had said that we are going to consider all tenders but they did not consider the claim extender, so, so they reached that obligation. <clears throat> okay, so let's review, uh, uh, this, that was all about offer, and let's quickly uh, review what we just discussed. Uh, it is important to distinguish an offer from an invitation to treat, right? You need to know what is an invitation to treat, okay? So ads, advertisements generally are invitation to treat unless it is certain from the wording of the ad that the seller uh, is trying to make an offer, okay? Like the case of the fur coat, Lefkowitz. Displays are generally invitations to treat, right? And the sale takes place on the cash register. So displays are just invitation to treat, it is not an offer. So auctions, there are two types of auctions with and without reserve. Auction with reserve is where the highest bid is set. Auction without reserve is where the high, there is no highest bid set and the object is sold to the highest bidder. Okay, so um, and with auctions, you need to remember that auctioneer um, acts in two capacities. One, as the seller's agent. Two, in, in its personal capacity. As a seller's agent, he just makes an invitation to treat. In his personal capacity, he uh, or she makes an offer. So um, if the seller removes the goods before the auctioneer accepted it, then seller is not in the problem, but the auctioneer is in problem. And tenders generally are invitation to treat. So there can be different responses to an offer. It can be a rejection, it can be a counter offer, it can be an inquiry, and most important of all, it can be an acceptance. So these are all the responses to an, to an offer, okay? So rejection is quite simple, right? It is when, if you offer me something and I say, oh, thank you, but no thanks, that's a rejection, okay? Counter offer. Uh, counter offer, offer is slightly uh, slightly confusing, but uh, and it is very important to distinguish a counter offer from an acceptance. Okay, so when the offeree changes the terms of the offer and sends it back to the offerer to accept, this is a counter offer. Let me give you an example. A says, "I offer to sell my car to you for five hundred pounds." B replies. I'll buy it for 400 pounds. It's then up to A to decide whether or not he wants to accept this offer, right? If A does not accept this off counter offer, then B cannot simply revert back and say, and accept the original offer for 500 pounds. B can counter, uh, B's counter offer destroyed A's original offer of 500 pounds. A can make a fresh offer of 500 pounds if he wants, and then B can accept. So that is one example of a counter offer. Inquiry. If inquirer does not intend to bounce back an offer, but simply wants to know more about the offer. It does not reject the original offer though. Remember, so that's the difference between counter offer and, an, and inquiry. Inquiry does not reject the original offer. Inquirer um, can later on accept the original offer. So basically, if, if you say I'm selling this car to you for uh, 500 pounds, I can ask you about some features of the car, right? But that does not mean that I'm, I'm uh, making, I'm rejecting your original offer and I'm making an, um, <clears throat> a counter offer. Or I can also say that um, 
uh, is it negotiable? I can just ask that, right? This is an inquiry. So this is not necessarily a counter offer. This is just an inquiry. If you don't reply to me or if you say no, no, negotiate, no negotiation, then I can still accept your original offer. Acceptance um, is acceptance by the offeree brings the offer to an end and it creates an agreement. Okay. Generally, an acceptance must be the mirror image of an offer. So uh, think about a counter offer and see if it fits the mirror image rule. In the previous example of where A is selling his car for 500 pounds and B says that no, I'll buy it for 400 pounds, is that a mirror image? The counter offer? No, it's not a mirror image, right? So it is not a, an acceptance. That was an that was a counter offer. Let's quickly look at a case. <clears throat> That's the leading case for counter offer. Um, and why we are paying so much attention to counter offer is because it is this important to distinguish counter offer from an acceptance as it was important for us to distinguish between invitation to treat and offer. So defendant offered to sell C a farm for 1,000 pounds, claiming made a counter offer of 950 pounds, right? Thus rejecting the first offer. Defendant rejected the counter offer. Claimant then tried to accept the original offer and upon defendant refusing, claimant sought an order for specific performance of the contract. The court found in favor of B, as we just discussed. So what was the ruling? The defendant offered to sell it for 1,000 pounds, and if that had been at once unconditionally accepted, there would undoubtedly have been a perfect binding contract. Instead of that, the plaintiff made an offer of his own to purchase the property for 950 pounds, and he thereby rejected the offer previously made by the defendant. So that was the ruling of it. That's the ratio definite and die of the uh, of this leading case, Hyde versus Wrench. So we need to remember this is one of the leading cases of counter offer. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay. So if the claimant, for example, in this case, if the claimant had accepted uh, the the offer of hundred one thousand pounds, then it would have been a mirror image of the offer. So it would have been an acceptance. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So let's look at another uh, another case. This is another important case, actually. It is Butler Machine Tool Company versus Excel Law Corporation. Right. So uh, claimants sent a quotation including claimants' terms and conditions, which included price variation clause. Defendant placed an order using own order form with their own terms and conditions, which allowed for no price variation clause. Defendant's order sheet contained a tier of confirmation slip, you know, the one that you just fill, fill, uh, fill in and tear it off and send it back. So the claimants provided defendant's order and completed tier of confirmation slip. Claimants later attempted to vary the price. However, defendant's term and condition wouldn't allow that. The court ruled in favor of the defendants. Okay. So the sellers, what was held? It was held that the sellers had expressly accepted the buyer's terms when they completed and returned the acknowledgement slip. Okay. Let me explain the same case to you uh, with the help of a diagram. So there were Actually, there were three stages in this case. Stage one. So look at the left-hand side of the diagram, stage one. Offer to sell by seller on seller standard terms, right? And that, uh, and seller standard terms had a price variation clause, which means the price could be varied. It was allowed. Stage two. It was a rejection. And counter offer by buyer on buyer standard terms. So buyer replied with their own standard terms. And in their standard terms, there was no price variation clause. 
Stage three went to court of uh, court of appeal. Uh, acceptance by sellers when they returned buyer's tear off slip, which incorporated buyer's standard terms. Sellers' original terms not in incorporated by reference. Right? Okay. So the seller argued something in the court of appeal, but the court of appeal rejected it. It was the seller was arguing that it was a fresh offer by sellers incorporating the standard terms and conditions of the original offer. But the court of appeal rejected this, and they said that no, it was an acceptance by sellers when they returned buyer's tear off slip. <clears throat> okay. So that was the leading case of acceptance that we just discussed. Um, another thing I just want to mention briefly is, and we're going to talk about this uh, in detail uh, in our next lecture, is that uh, there is a general rule that acceptance must be communicated to the offerer, which means that it must come to the attention of the offerer. Okay, and the leading case <clears throat> here is Carnell versus Carbolic smoke ball company. The rule that was stated in this uh, case was, as general proposition, when an offer is made, it is necessary in order to make a binding contract, not only that it should be accepted, but the acceptance should be notified. Okay. So, <clears throat> once we have ruled out the possibility that a purported acceptance is in fact um, a counter offer, I suppose, we must then ask whether it conforms to the general rule that acceptance must, must be communicated to the offerer. So once we have distinguished counteroffer and acceptance and we say that, okay, no, this is not a counteroffer, this is an acceptance, we must also see whether uh, it was communicated. So this is what we're going to discuss in our next lecture. And in addition to that, we are also going to discuss uh, the mode of acceptance, acceptance by silence, acceptance by an act, and then we'll also discuss death of an offer. When does an offer comes to an end? Revocation and uh, lapse. <clears throat> and also, I will briefly mention um, unilateral contracts in our next lecture. So, um, first half of the lecture next week is going to be based on these topics that we just that I just mentioned, and the second half will be dedicated to a, a real exam question. So we'll work together on a real exam question, and then I will provide you with feedback on how an examiner wants you to answer a question in an exam. Okay. All right. So um, let's take a few minutes and uh, answer some questions so that you review what you have learned today. Um, I have a scenario here, okay? Let me open up my chat box so I see. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the question is, A advertises in his local newspaper that he has 30 digital radios for sale at a bargain price of 30 uh, pounds or near offer, available until the end of the month. Contact me at PO Box 76. Is the advert an offer or an invitation to treat? Sandeep, I'll answer your question after we're done discussing the, these questions and answers. Okay, Jennifer is saying A. Anu is saying A, okay. Okay, so some of you are saying invitation to treat. Remember there are two options that say invitation to treat. So you need to pick one out of these. So A is saying invitation to treat and D also says it is an invitation to treat. But the reasons are different. <laughs> okay, Jennifer, you change your mind and you're saying it's D. Uh, Caroline, you're saying D. Andrea, yes. Okay. Okay. D. Uh, 
Okay, a lot of you are saying D. Yes, that's absolutely right. So why A is not correct? Um, because it is not it is not sufficient to say that um, it is an invitation to treat because advertisements are presumed to be invitations to treat because we have some cases that are to they say to the contrary, right? Like the cases in uh, the case of Lefkowitz. Um, whereas D is the advertisement invitation to treat because advertiser does not know how many responses he will get and at what price. So it becomes very unreasonable for it to uh, be considered uh, an offer, right? And especially that he is using a PO box method. So he wouldn't know that how many, uh, who responded to him first, basically. So even if he limits it to uh, maybe first 10 responses, it would be hard for him to know who accepted, who are the first 10 ex people who accepted the offer. Okay. Good. Okay, another question. Um, which of the following statements are true in relation, um, in relation to auctions without reserve? A, the owner promises to sell to the highest bidder. B, the auctioneer on behalf of the owner invites bids and bidders make offers to buy, which may be accepted or rejected on behalf of the owner. If a person makes the highest bid, the owner is obligated to sell. D, the auctioneer promises to sell, the, sell to the highest bidder. There are more than one correct answers. B and D, so some of you are saying B. Okay, A. <laughs> B. Can we saying B, A and B. Scott is saying B and D. Okay, let's see. Oh, sorry. Okay, so ah, C is wrong. If a person makes the highest bid, the owner is obligated to sell. Owner is not obligated to sell, but the auctioneer is obligated to sell. Mm -hmm. D is right, auctioneer promises to sell to the highest bidder. Okay, good. B, let's see if B is right or wrong. The auctioneer on behalf of the owner invites bids and bidders uh, make offers to buy which may be accepted or rejected on behalf of the owner. The auctioneer on behalf of the owner invites the bid and bidders and makes an invitation to treat on behalf of the on behalf of the owner, he is making an invitation to treat, not an offer. Right? So, B is correct. B and D. Yes, B and D are correct. That's absolutely right. And why A is not correct? The owner promises to sell to the highest bidder. Yes, owner is not directly selling, the owner is not the auctioneer, and on his behalf, the auctioneer is promising to sell to the highest bidder. Excellent. Okay, one more question. It is a fill in the blank. A purported acceptance that changes the terms of the offer is known as a blank and constitutes a rejection of the original offer. Excellent, counter offer, very good. Yes, that is absolutely correct. The answer is counter offer because a counter offer is treated as rejecting the original offer. The counter offer cannot subsequently go back and accept the original offer. And the leading case was hide and wrench. Okay, so thank you everybody. Um, that was the end of our lecture today and I will see you next Saturday at 
7 a.m. that is California time. So check your local times for that. Um, and 